Morning, everybody. People have been asking me about this internet character called Andrew Tate. Now, I'd never heard of him until August this year when he sort of burst into the scene uh, as a free speech martyr. Now, I didn't mention anything at the time, and uh, I wasn't going to say anything um, even at the moment. But a lot of people have been asking me, okay, what do I think? And so on. So uh, this is a bit of a minefield because there's so many levels and layers of, of issues uh, to talk about and to weave together. So I don't know if I'll make a good job of this, but let's dive in and hope I don't get blown up by the minefield um, that is the situation at the moment. So look, where shall I start? Look, I made a video a few months ago, which was called um, The Dangers of Fighting transgenderism with feminism. Now, that's nothing to do with Andrew Tate directly, but it is very much the case indirectly. The point I was making there is that if you're conservative, okay, if you're a traditionalist, if you want to restore uh, traditional conservative values, I don't, um, by that, I don't mean anything to do with the fake conservative party. I just mean, you know, good, Christian, traditional family values where, you know, we just restore common sense to our country. Um, if you want to do that, one of the things that you realize is completely destructive and corrosive to society at the moment is the whole gender ideology. And I would oppose that with everything I have because it's just insane. Now, hardcore feminists are also against this gender ideology, but not for the same reasons that I am or we are. They're against it because there's a clash of rights. Women's rights are being suppressed by trans rights. And hardcore feminists are not happy about that because they see their rights, they're not at the top of the victim tree anymore. Trans people are. So they want to fight against this transgenderism because they want to establish themselves at the top of the that uh, tree again. Uh, women's rights, they want to come out on top of trans rights. Now, I would completely agree with these hardcore feminists that, you know, this whole <laughs> gender ideology is toxic and destructive and we don't want it to be embedded in law. But would they agree with me or would I agree with them on anything else? No. No. I would be pro-life and for traditional family values. The moment that ever, ever, anything ever gets defeated in terms of gender ideology, they'd be back at me, having a go at me. So although we might agree completely and 100% on one issue, um, we have nothing else in common. So this is the old um, saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, it's not entirely true. It may be for a certain thing, but then, you know, if you if you actually defeat your common enemy, then you just go back to, to uh, you know, um, tearing bits of it out of each other as well. Now, the reason I mention that um, and to do with Andrew Tate is is this, because there's so much that he says that I would agree with. Um, and particularly in speaking out against the toxicity of radical feminism, which is completely destructive to men and masculinity. And on those things, I would totally 100% agree with. And I would say, you know, actually, um, young men in particular are so beaten down, so emasculated by feminism, which is really being destructive to masculinity, deliberately so. Um, hardcore feminists can say anything they like about men. They can be as derogatory, as offensive as as they like. If some of the things that Andrew Tate had said <clears throat> about women, <clears throat> which I don't, I, I don't like the way he said things. This is coming onto it. It's come, come, coming onto it. Um, but if feminists had said what he had said about men, there would have been no problem at all with the powers that be. But the things that Andrew Tate has said about women, not against the ideology, but actually against women themselves, and that's when you cross the line, 
But if women had said what he had said, they'd be fine. But he was cancelled for saying lots of things which were derogatory to women. <clears throat> um, the, the person, the people, the women, the, rather than the ideology. So that's so when you cross that line, you see, that's when I would disagree because um, feminism is destructive, but we need to fight it not by doing the opposite and not just turning it around and becoming as abusive and as offensive as feminists are to men. And obviously, with the whole Me Too movement, there was a move to actually go back and and you know, put men in jail, you know, for things that were okay 20 years ago, you know, go back historically and look at things and try to make up cases about, you know, men have done this, men have done that. Let's depower them, emasculate them, put them in jail, which I think was like some kind of witch hunt um, that's going on. So he spoke out about that. But he's also somebody who boasts about treating women badly. Now, that's not right. Now, it's one thing to actually go against feminist ideology, but when you actually run a business which exploits women and those women in turn exploit men who are broken and lost, you know, and get addicted to online things, you know what I'm talking about, that is degenerate itself. So he's very, very different, similar but different, in nuance to someone like Jordan Peterson. And so there's a line there that Jordan Peterson hasn't crossed, but he's attacking the ideology, the, the destructive ideologies, but is not going into being destructive himself. So there's a line there, um, which is uh, a line that I think he's crossed. And there are far, far more worthy people to elevate uh, and put on a pedestal as free speech martyrs, as he's been done. So I, I never mentioned him back uh, when he was deplatformed from all of these kind of platforms. He was taken off Facebook and Instagram and, and, and Twitter and, and all these kind of things. Accused of being misogynistic. Okay, and he was. Absolutely. As I said, feminists who are just as misandrous don't get deplatformed. But I think there's far, far more worthy people to um, speak about if you want to speak about free speech. Um, you know, for example, we've got uh, Isabel Vaughan Spruce this week was uh, arrested by the police for simply praying in her head outside an abortion centre when it was closed, for example. Um, I think those are people that are actually doing good and are not descending into something that uh, is, is degenerate itself. Um, to fight another form of degeneracy. So that's the difference there. Um, as for his case here, now, he's been arrested and uh, hasn't been charged yet, but he's been held for 30 days. Well, this is very, very worrying that, um, you know, the police can just hold someone without charge for a month. You know, if they're going to arrest somebody and charge them with something, they should do it immediately. You know, they were, the, the Romanian police said uh, they've been investigating him and his brother for um, six months or something. And then they've arrested him. But they haven't been able to charge them in the first 24 hours. So they're holding them to try to come up with some charges. So, you know, why have they not got charges ready? When you arrest someone, you know what you're going to charge them with. You know, well, they've been accused of, of these things, of, um, what is it, um, uh, suspicion of human trafficking and so on. I don't know whether this is true or not. If it is true, absolutely, he should be um, jailed for that. But if it isn't true, then he shouldn't be held for a month on something that they haven't been able to pin it on 
pin anything on him yet. So, you know, they, they would have, if they hadn't got this ruling from the judge in Romania, he would have been released. So I don't know about this. What I do know is that there are people that obviously have done far, far worse. Um, people who are connected with Epstein. And none of those people have been brought to justice. And we, the, the powers that be know about them and have known about them for years and years and years. And they still just go walking free. They're probably laughing. They, they seem to be able to do whatever they want with absolute impunity. And uh, nothing happens to them at all. So if the powers that be are going to go after Andrew Tate, I don't know. We assume he's innocent until proven guilty. If he's proven guilty, fair enough. He, he deserves to go to prison uh, if he's guilty of the things he's been charged of. <coughs> but the people who've done far worse, Hunter Biden, for example. We all know about Hunter Biden's laptop and all the things that are on there. And that's now um, been proven to be true. And yet he's still walking around free. So, you know, there is two-tier justice here. This is just another example of two-tier justice where somebody, you know, who goes to some extent against the narratives of the system is um, finds themselves arrested and jailed. But then other people who are you do far, far worse but are playing the game um, just continue to walk around free and are free to... Um, you know, children are not safe from them. And uh, this is absolutely wrong uh, that this is happening. So, you know, the title of the video here is is Andrew Tate and Prince Andrew. Now, I'm not going to say anything specifically about uh, Prince Andrew, but uh, I think we, we all know the background of uh, that particular person and uh, the, the, the things that he's uh, uh, went to court for. And uh, the court cases that he he um, was uh, involved in. So there you go. This is a, a situation with a lot of nuance. And what I would say as well is, you know, that I haven't said before, is that, you know, this is just an indication of how broken society is. That, that men are so bashed down, particularly young men. Um that someone can come along like Andrew Tate, who is a one brilliant businessman, absolutely brilliant businessman, has exploited a gap in the market, which has been created by the brokenness of millions and millions of young men who are fatherless and have not been brought up to know what it is to be a good man. And have been just beaten down into being a nice guy, a doormat. Some of them don't even want to be men at all. They want to be, you know, women these days and, and do whatever they, they can to appear to be women. Um, and you have someone come along who's a bad boy. And they call him Top G. And he gives them some kind of power back. But it's not done in a way that heals their brokenness and their lostness. It just gives them like a shell of pretend masculinity and this aura or persona of being the bad boy. But that's something for them to get them out of the depression of the, the brokenness that they are living in and the broken spirit that they have. But it's not going to heal them right in the deepest parts of them and teach them how to be a good man. What Andrew Tate is doing is getting these guys, is teaching them how to be a bad boy, how to be a G, whatever that is. <laughs> I don't aspire to be a G myself. Um, you know, look, he shows himself, look, here I am surrounded by lots of cars. I've got lots of money. I've got lots of wealth. I've got lots of women. And that is, you know, portrayed to young men as being the life. That's what it is to be a man, to have lots of stuff and uh, flaunt your wealth and success, your earthly material wealth and success. But that isn't what it is to be a good man. That's what it is to be a bad boy and a G. But that's not what men really need um, to be taught. 
what young men really need is to be taught how to be a good man who loves yourself for yourself, not for what you have or how many women you have or how many cars you have, and to be a good man who can love other people as well. And so ultimately, the only person who can show you and teach you how to be a good man if you are broken uh, by society and the society is is broken and 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 beaten from decades and decades of, of this cultural Marxist stuff. It's not Andrew Tate. It's Jesus Christ. <laughs>